So I, I work in cancer genomics and, um, and I want to introduce that field to you because it's, it's probably new, the details of it are new to many. But what I really want to also emphasize is what we're doing here at Garvin, which is somewhat unique in the country, which is taking this idea of genomics, this incredibly complicated research tool, and moving it into making a difference in the clinic. And that's been a really difficult uh, barrier to overcome, but we're, we're getting there with persistence and practice where we're now actually providing these innovations to, to people who have cancer. But before I get too much into that, I'll talk about what is genomics. Uh, genomics is the study of the genome. And the genome is the complete set of genetic material inside an organism, such as you or me. But in terms of what it actually looks like, well, in practical terms, the genome is our DNA. And inside a cell, if you catch a cell at just the right time, this is what the, the human genome looks like, all these little crosses, which we call sister chromatids. And if you zoom in and in and in, eventually you get down to the double helix molecule, which has been packed in there. And it is that which is our DNA and which encodes so much about us. Biologists, we don't really look at the DNA like this so often. Instead, we, uh, we observe that DNA is really like uh, Lego blocks, four different Lego blocks stuck together in a chain. And we give each of those four little blocks a different letter, A, C, G, or T. And so one way of representing the human genome is as this string of A's, C's, G's, and T's. Just on and on and on it goes. But it's a lot larger than that. Um, so in terms of size, if you were to think about the uh, bound version of the Encyclopedia Britannica, and if you were to type all those A's, C's, G's, and T's in there at the same size of that font, it would take around about 20 volumes to store one copy of the human genome. And that's present in almost all of your cells, so much so that if you strung them end to end, as small as it is, it would make its way to the moon and back around 100,000 times. So there's a lot of DNA inside of us. And the, the challenge has been trying to understand it and, and what all those letters mean and, and how we can uh, decipher what this code is, because it's so important. It is one way of saying it's the idiot's guide to making a human, but it does contain within it information that encodes how we are different from each other, our, our eye color, our hair color, but also traits such as uh, the foods that we like to eat or can eat, and most importantly for us, our susceptibility to diseases and how we respond to treatment. That's all in there, but the challenge has been figuring out how, how it's encoded in, these, in this string of letters and then how to actually make use of that in the clinic. And that has taken a very long time. Because many of you probably remember that around 2000, the Human Genome Project was wrapping up and there was a big fanfare that this was going to be the end of disease. Uh, and it hasn't obviously uh, come out quite that way. But we're finally getting to the point where we're starting to make some real difference using genomics. And it's been called the genomic revolution. And one of the reasons it took so long is how hard it was to measure all those billions of bases of DNA. In 2003, they just wrapped up the Human Genome Project. They looked at half of one human genome, and it took 13 years and over $100 million. Today, not so long after, we can now do 50 a day here in Garvin. That's the, that's the pace of progress that we've had, from one in 13 years to 50 in a day. And this has been made possible by these incredible new machines. Uh, some of you may have seen them up on level seven. This is the one that we have here. Uh, and it's, it's enabled these fantastic new possibilities in research, but it hasn't yet really made its way to the clinic so much. And so what I'll be talking about today, getting into the cancer side of things, is what we've been doing here at Garvin to translate this new technology into the clinic. I'll be talking about how we've used it at first to understand cancer in a population for pancreatic cancer, then how to understand cancer in a single person and then moving to treatment to try to actually bring this out into the clinic to make a difference to patients. And then finally touching on how we can maybe make a difference to cancer before it's even appeared. Uh, I'm only going to spend one slide on this project, although it did take us 10 years, which is, uh, which is how it goes, but time constraints mean it's, it's the case. But Garvin was um, part of the Australian Pancreatic Cancer Genome Initiative. It's, this was part of an international collaboration to sequence cancers to look at their genomes. 
because cancer is a disease of the genome. Cancer happens when our normal cells that have normal genes are somehow, the genes change and the instructions that tell a cell to behave and do what it's supposed to get scrubbed out and so the cell starts instead replicating and replicating without stop and that is what cancer is. So by reading the DNA in the cancer cells we can understand what has happened to make a normal cell, a good cell, into a bad one and we can hopefully understand how to stop it. So what we did is we, we aimed to do this for pancreatic cancer because pancreatic cancer was very poorly understood and many of you probably know it's a very dire cancer to have. And many of the drugs that we try just don't work. And we thought that pancreatic cancer was just hard to treat. It was just a bad one. And, and there was nothing that more that could be done. But then we thought, well, perhaps if we looked deeply inside it, we could start to better understand how it works. And what we had discovered after sequencing the cancers of many hundreds of, of people is that pancreatic adenocarcinoma is really fairly not one disease. Although it all looks the same under the microscope and it's all treated the same, it's probably not all the same disease. And that actually we're not treating one disease, but perhaps we're trying to treat 20. And when that's the case, it makes sense that one, one drug does not fit all the people. That instead you need to find the right drug for, the, for each person. And when, we did, and when we did that, we had some dramatic responses, uh, quite, quite striking for pancreatic cancer. And this really ushered in, for us and other people doing similar work, the idea of precision medicine. That what we need to do is we need to match the drug to the patient, not treat everybody the same. And that genomics was going to be the way that we could do that, by looking inside an individual cancer, finding out how it works, and then finding out exactly where we need to throw a spoke in the wheels to stop it. And this, as I said, this is not new. Um, Jimmy Carter has received uh, precision medicine treatment for his metastatic melanoma, um, and it, it worked for him. Um, Larotrectinib, I'll be showing you some very promising results about that soon, is, is the new wonder drug. So after we learned that from um, the APGI, we thought, well, in the research sense, could we start moving this into helping individual people? And I'll be talking about the case of a boy with um, brain cancer. So uh, I'll refer to him as Matthew, and, and Matthew was about 10 when he started um, complaining of a persistent headache, and, and a scan revealed that he had a brain tumor, a very aggressive one. Uh, he, he did not respond to conventional therapy. And so we were approached at the end um, because no, we, no one knew what to do to say, well, could we look at his cancer and could we maybe find how it works and find some way to treat it? Uh, at the time, it was fortunate that we just set up the Kinghorn Center for Clinical Genomics with those incredible machines that uh, they're upstairs through some very, very generous grants. And this really enabled us to do this, to look at Matthew's cancer and to try and help him. Because the, the scale of the problem is large. You remember the Encyclopedia Britannica as I showed you before? Uh, cancer is more difficult than just sequencing a, a healthy person. Uh, in, if you move the Encyclopedia Britannica onto the scale of the QVB, that is the number. Uh, each of those little blocks is a complete set. That is the number that we had to sequence through the machines to look at Matthew's cancer. Uh, a truly incredible deluge of information, but it's easy now. And that's how incredible things have incredibly things have changed. So we, we did that and we turned it around in about seven days. And then we had to go to the biology side of things, which is look at how the cells work. And this is a ridiculously high level view of all the things that go on in just one part of a cell. And look at all the things that were wrong with Matthew's cancer and find out, well, how does this work? How does this change this? How does this make it into a cancer? And so we look at it at this level and then we narrow it down a little bit. And then eventually, after a few sleepless nights that I, I will never forget, um, we found that one gene was probably the thing that we could hit to help him. TSC2 acts as a handbrake on the cell. It was gone in his case, in his cancer, and so the brakes were off and off it was going. And TSC2 is a, is a gene that we can drug with something called Tempsirolimus. So we fed that back in, in seven days. It was a real Herculean effort on our part. Um, but tragically, Matthew was very unwell by that point because it had taken a long time uh, for us to get uh, contacted. And uh, although he received a, a similar drug called Sirolimus and it did a 
I'm told, help him a little bit. He did, unfortunately, pass away about two years ago. Um, and that was uh, really tragic for us because we were really believing in, in what we were doing and we were hoping to help. Uh, but something did come of all of this, and that was that in parallel, another group had been analyzing his cancer as well, using a much slower technique, it takes many, many months to get a result, but it gives a sure result. And they tested over 100 drugs on his cancer. Um, unfortunately, the results were ready after he passed away. And two out of over 100 worked, and one of them was Temsorolimus. So this really v told us two things. One, you can try over 100 drugs and only two of them will work. It's critical that you get the right one. And two, that our approach can give you the right answer and we can get something in a week's time. And that unfortunately in his case, he was so sick by the time that he got these drugs that maybe nothing would have helped. But this really brought home the idea that what we need to do is scale this out is don't do it for one person when, when things are too difficult to help, but bring it out there into the clinic and make a real difference. And so I'm very briefly now, because I know I'm running short on time, going to be talking about some programs that we have to actually bring this technology to the clinic. So one is the Lions Kids Cancer Genome Project, uh, which is run here by Dr. Mark Kelly, but also is very much based at the Children's Cancer Institute in Randwick. And this is, um, you know, really the beneficiary of a very generous amount of money from Lions International and Australia. And it allows us to do what we did for Matthew for 400 children over a few years. And the results so far have been very promising. It's a very difficult project to work on personally because of the stories that we get, but it can be quite rewarding. And this is one example. This is a, a 10 month old uh, baby with infantile fibrosarcoma. So on the left hand side, it's, it's a little hard to see the dotted lines actually obscure the tumor margins, but the baby has a, has a very large tumor and is on life support in ICU. Uh, then he was given uh, chemotherapy, uh, but it did nothing. So after two weeks, if anything, the, the, the cancer had grown. And it was at this point that the Lions Project came in and found something in his cancer which we can try hit with that drug I showed you before, larotrectinib. And two weeks after that, you can see already the cancer started to shrink. Two weeks after that, he's out of ICU. And the last I've heard is still doing well. So this works. It can be done. And, and it's a real tribute to all the hard people, uh, hardworking people at, in Randwick, uh, here and throughout the, um, the Sydney networks to, to make this possible. But it's not only for children. And another thing we're doing is most. My apologies. Um, and uh, we're, we're doing this in adult cancer as well. And so far we've got 362 patients enrolled and we did just 24 in a meeting yesterday. And so this is all moving forward into making precision medicine a commodity and we're working with the Genome One spin-off to be able to commercialize this. And so that everyone can get access to this kind of technology without having to hope that a trial is funded and suits them. And finally, I'll be just covering my, my particular overwork now, which is cancer risk. And, and uh, our idea is that perhaps the best way to deal with cancer is to treat it very early. And how do we treat it early? Well, we find people who are at very high risk of cancer and then we put them in for screening. And so my work is, uh, is really on the left-hand side of this, finding those people who are high risk. And then Mandy Bellinger is running a, a very comprehensive program of screening. And so far, early results are that if we can identify people at high risk, we can screen them, we can find cancers when they're small enough to just cut out in some cases, and that's a cure. No chemo needed. So my closing points are that genomics is really finally starting to make good on its promises. Um, and that genome-driven personalized therapy is something that we have ready now and are applying here at Garvin. And we're looking forwards to see uh, how we can develop this into a, a commodity product that's used for everybody, and, um, and how we can look at cancer risk as well. Uh, please ignore these because there are literally hundreds of people involved in these projects. Um, but thank you so much for your time. We have time for a couple of questions. Does anybody have any? Oh, 
I was wondering if the, the preventive uh, measures rather than just curing uh, measures undertaken. Definitely. Um, certainly if we can identify people at high risk of cancer, then we can, you know, advocate preventive measures for them. The funny thing is, though, that really you'd, you'd want everybody to, <laughs> to, uh, to take these preventive measures. So um, in, in that sense, you'd, you'd sell, say that to everyone. What is your criteria for your choice of those 362 patients that you are currently uh, researching? And is there an age input there? Uh, I'd like to know that, thank you. Okay, so this is with, res with regards to the MOST program? Yep. So uh, MOST deals with adult cancers, and the, the cutoff is, is really at the pediatric adult threshold in late teens. Um, in terms of which cancers are, or which, which people are eligible, the program is really designed for people with unmet need. So uh, what that comes down to is if you're on your last line of therapy, uh, and if there's not another trial which would be a better fit for you, then you're, you're probably a good, um, a good candidate for most. Primarily, well, I'm, I'm at the Garvin, so I kind of only see one side of it. There are researchers at St. Vincent's as well, but uh, with regards to cancer, which is my area, the primarily at Garvin. Thank you so much, Mark. Thank, Thank you. you. Sorry.